whomever becomes the next US president, she or he will be expected to live up to a promise that both have made, to get back the secure, well-paid employment enjoyed by previous generations of American workers. But is that even possible in today's globalized world? We sent Bob Abe's house in search of the great American job. American voters consistently rank jobs as the most important issue in electing a president. My primary mission as president will be to create more opportunity and more good jobs with rising wages right here in the United States. Polls show that jobs and the economy are the top priority for as many as 44% of voters. I am going to bring back our jobs to Ohio and Pennsylvania and all of America. And I am not going to let companies move to other countries without consequence. Not going to happen anymore. Donald Trump says he will levy tariffs on companies who offshore their production and on Chinese imports. We will never, ever sign bad trade deals. America first. In my first 100 days, we will work with both parties to pass the biggest investment in new, good-paying jobs since World War II. Hillary Clinton promises to bolster America's shrinking middle class by investing $500 billion in roads and bridges and 21st century technology like renewable energy grids. But we wanted to find out if the candidates' job proposals will work and if they address basic economic challenges facing U.S. capitalism. So we set off on a road trip through America's heartland. The journey started in Ohio, a battleground state that Trump must win. Trumbull County, a jurisdiction both campaigns have targeted, lost 49% of its manufacturing jobs between 2000 and 2010. And this parking lot used to be packed with cars, so you can imagine how many people worked here. Mark Zygmunt worked on economic development for more than 20 years, trying to persuade companies to locate and stay in Trumbull County. We'd offer them tax incentives. We had a couple of loan programs. But that didn't help with the company that owned this plant, an auto parts company called Delphi. What did their employment go from? It was probably around 10,000, and it's probably now about maybe 1,500. Actually, they started moving down to Mississippi even in the uh, middle 70s. That started to go. So it had nothing to do with trade deals or anything like that. It was more to do with a lower wages. Manufacturing jobs here migrated first to anti-union states in the U.S. South, then to Mexico and China. These were good-paying blue-collar jobs. Right. Yes, they were. You know, all your hospitalization, you had a retirement plan. So when you retired from here, you could live a decent life. It was the way we thought America was going to be forever. In the 2000s, Trumbull County also lost thousands of jobs in the steel industry and at General Motors Lordstown factory where the cruise auto is built. Most of the Lordstown jobs, they went away because of different ways of manufacturing. So is this a highly automated plant now? Oh yeah. When they first opened this plant, there was probably 11, 12,000 people that worked here then. And now there's around 4,500. Do you think getting tough on trade and tariffs can bring manufacturing jobs back here to Trumbull County? I doubt it. A lot of these jobs are gone. But many in this part of Ohio, traditionally a Democratic bastion, believe that Trump can bring the jobs back. We've never seen this in my adult lifetime, and 40% of the people coming in here tell us they're Democrats. The Republican county chair, Randy Law, says the crossover vote is unprecedented. Uh, Donald Trump is the kind of candidate that I think a lot of people have been waiting for. Complete free trade just opens everything up. We have to look out for American interests. Aren't you concerned that some of Trump's trade policies could unleash protectionism and seize up the trading system? I don't think it will. I think that's just a scare tactic on the other side. I want a tough negotiator. I want a tough leader. I need about six. So did this man. 
He's a union auto worker at the Lordstown plant who voted Democratic in the past. Next year, Chrysler won't build a small car in the United States. I'll be building Mexico. They want to go down there and make them cheap? Tax them when they come in here. Use that money to build a wall. Build whatever you want. The Lordstown factory lost a lot of jobs from automation. But we're still working. What about the steel mills around here? Are they still working? Everybody got no right to work. And I think Trump will keep us working. The idea that the president of the United States can wave a magic wand and reverse these trends uh, is a fantasy. Economist and author James Galbraith notes that out of about 152 million American jobs today, only about 8 percent are in manufacturing. It is not going to go back up to 30 percent, which it was again, let's say, 1950. And so the scope for actually achieving a jobs renaissance through the manufacturing sector isn't as large as Mr. Trump's trade strategy would um, appear to make it. Ramping up American manufacturing to replace imported goods could not only drive up the cost to consumers, but would produce fewer jobs than in the past. It's not as though those factories are just sitting around waiting to be opened up again. Uh, they would have to be rebuilt. And they would be rebuilt with the best available productive technology, which by itself would involve fewer workers uh, than the old uh, manufacturing systems which have disappeared. But the costs of globalization have become too much for millions of American workers and manufacturers. Well, in the decade from 2000 to 2010, uh, the Chinese began dumping extrusions into not only the United States but Canada at below market prices. Herb Schuler is the owner of a company in Ohio that molds aluminum parts for consumer and industrial products. The aluminum extrusion industry was on the verge of being wiped out in the U.S. until the government levied a 35 percent tariff on Chinese imports. The Chinese government was subsidizing the extruders and a lot of jobs were lost, a lot of business went overseas. But once we won our sanctions and we won our tariffs, much of that business has come back here to North America. A recent study argues that the U.S. lost 2.4 million jobs because of Chinese imports between 1999 and 2011. Trump has said he will impose a 45 percent tariff on all Chinese goods. I'm not sure you're going to be able to just pass a 45 percent across the board trade tariff, but, you know, something I, I think is appropriate. Hillary Clinton says she will appoint a chief trade prosecutor and ramp up enforcement. And when countries break the rules, we won't hesitate to impose targeted tariffs. We have discovered instances where the Chinese are trying to cheat the rules, cheat the regulations. You know, it's going to be a constant struggle. You know, not just for our industry, but I think for the entire global trade order. A tariff can work, but sometimes it doesn't work because there's multiple sources of supply and you run into just difficulty of enforcement. Clyde Prestowitz has worked on trade negotiations in both Republican and Democratic administrations. He argues that neither Trump nor Clinton has presented a comprehensive plan to deal with America's $500 billion annual trade deficit. The key point is this globalization thing is not working uh, as we were told uh, and we got to fix it. And, and uh, when, you, when you say it that way, then you're raising not just trade, you're raising investment, you're raising technology flow, you're raising the issue of what's the purpose of the company. He says that trade deals weren't about opening up new markets to create American jobs. Their real purpose was to make China and Mexico safe for U.S. corporate investment. These negotiations are strongly, strongly influenced by U.S. corporations who all have large lobbying operations here in Washington. And it has led to pressure on U.S. negotiators to negotiate arrangements that facilitate the offshoring of U.S.-based production. The terms of NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement, make it easier for American companies like the Carrier Corporation, a division of United Technologies, to offshore production to Mexico. The best way to stay competitive and protect the business for long term is to move production from our facility in Indianapolis to Monterey, Mexico. The move to Mexico is eliminating 1,400 jobs in Indianapolis, a point Trump hammers on repeatedly. You know, use the case of Carrier. Every single air conditioning unit they make in Mexico 
they're going to pay a 35% tax. From Ohio, we headed to Indianapolis and met with two carrier workers who are losing their jobs. I'm 55 years old. Probably the biggest thing is the fear of the unknown. You, you don't know what your future holds. I mean, the jobs that's left over here is uh, paying way less and way less benefits. What do you think of United Technologies' argument that they need to move to Mexico to stay competitive? I mean, the com we made them billions of dollars last year. So they're saving $65 million a year? Yeah. When you go down there and you can pay less than $3 an hour, probably with no benefits, you know, no union, you have no regulations that you deal with here. So, you know, it's all for more money to maximize the profits. United Technologies declined our request for an interview, but its chief financial officer said the carrier move was necessary to increase shareholder value. Wall Street puts constant pressure on corporations to get their stock price up. In fact, United Technologies also bought back $10 billion of its own stock in the months preceding the carrier announcement, according to economist William Lazonic throwing away $10 billion just to pump up their stock price. There's so many things that they could do with that. They certainly don't have to get rid of 1,400 workers. How important do you think dealing with the buyback phenomena is to addressing the jobs challenges in America? Absolutely central. In the 1960s and 70s, major U.S. corporations reinvested about 60% of their earnings in capital expenditures, innovation, and their workforce. Lazonic, who tracks the stock repurchases of the S&P 500, says that today, because of buybacks, it's only 10% or less. Retain the money, invest it in, in people and productive capabilities. That's the foundation of both a prosperous company and a prosperous economy. And buybacks are just the opposite of that. They are taking the money out of companies, distributing it to shareholders, and these companies are being looted. This is trillions and trillions of dollars of the companies that have been at the, the, the bedrock of the U.S. economy. If you don't create a middle class there, you're not going to have middle class jobs. Large buybacks used to be considered market manipulation. But in the 1980s, Ronald Reagan's Securities and Exchange Commission made them legal. At the same time, the increase in the use of stock options as a form of compensation incentivized executives to pump their company's stock price. The highest paid executives, about 80%, 80 percent uh, of their pay comes from stock-based pay. Now, if the people who run the companies see that their job is just to get the stock price up, and they get rewarded for that, uh, they are going to do a lot of damage to the economy. Hillary Clinton has talked about combating short-termism in corporate boardrooms and on Wall Street. It's time to start measuring value in terms of years or the next decade, not just the next quarter. She has uttered the words quarterly capitalism, but we should ban stock buybacks. And to get rid of that problem, you have to call the whole ideology of maximizing shareholder value into question. That ideology also took off during the Reagan years. We're going to turn the bull loose. Before the 1980s, the notion was that the CEO is the custodian of a public trust. The communities, the customers, the workers are all stakeholders in this corporation, then Wall Street essentially needed to shift the loyalty of the CEO away from his people toward the shareholders. And how do you do that? Well, you tell the CEO, listen, if you start holding down the wages of your people, or better yet, if you move your job, their jobs to China, we'll make you so rich that you won't be leaving. And that's essentially what has happened. We headed for Illinois, the birthplace of the theory of maximizing shareholder value who was founded by conservative free market thinkers at the University of Chicago. Known as the Chicago School, they were led by the Nobel Prize winning economist Milton Friedman, who worked in this building right behind me. Friedman penned a seminal 1970 article, which argued that since shareholders were the owners of corporations, the sole social responsibility of businesses was to increase profits. Members of the Chicago School, who are still alive, declined our requests for interviews. The, the wreckage of that system is uh, out there for anybody to see. So long as Wall Street is calling the tune, you are going to facilitate a culture of asset stripping in difficult times, rather than attempting to sustain and build upon the value added of the corporation. Another strategy pushed by Wall Street to pump up stock prices is mergers. To examine their impact on jobs, we left Chicago and headed down to St. Louis, Missouri. 
There we met with Brian Feldman, a researcher for the Open Markets Project at the New America Foundation. St. Louis has a monopoly problem. During the 1980s, St. Louis had some 23 Fortune 500 uh, locally owned headquartered companies, and today that number has dropped to eight. And as a result, St. Louis and its economy have taken a large toll. Ironically, St. Louis played an historic role in combating monopoly in the U.S. 135 years ago, a railroad baron used his control of this bridge to monopolize trade across the Mississippi. It led to the passage of the most important antitrust legislation in America. During the beginning of the 20th century, we see these statues enforced vigorously and for a majority of Americans, we see increases in small business growth, we see fair competition. Changes in antitrust policy began showing up with the deregulation of the airlines in the late 1970s. St. Louis was a major hub for TWA, but because of airline mergers, the city now has a half-empty airport with drastically reduced service. There were some 1,400 flights arriving and departing daily, and today uh, that's down to around 500, and some 2,500 jobs were lost. You know, when you cut off such a large component of employment, that's going to sort of lead to these ripple effects in other parts of the local economy as well. The aerospace and defense contractor, McDonnell Douglas, is another of the 23 Fortune 500 companies in St. Louis that was taken over. When Boeing acquired McDonnell Douglas in 1997, it cut some 7,000 jobs. So that was a tremendous blow on employment here. Absolutely, tremendous. And McDonnell Douglas, at its peak, employed over 3% of the entire Metro St. Louis uh, region. And today, that is down to 1%. Between 1997 and 2012, more than two-thirds of some 900 U.S. industry sectors became more concentrated. Consolidation decreases the number of new startups. As companies acquire or market power, it's harder for new entrants to enter those industries. Mergers in the banking industry have also made it harder for small businesses, which generate most of the new jobs in America. So this was the original building for Boatman's Bank. See the symbol there at the bottom? That's the old Mississippi River boat. That was the symbol of Boatman's Bank. It was a local bank, and it was known for lending in the community. In 1996, attorney Eric Vickers led protests against the takeover of Boatman's by Nations Bank. Then two years later, Nations Bank merged with Bank of America, becoming the second largest bank in the U.S. Do you think that the takeover of these local banks had a real impact on St. Louis? Apparently devastating. The lending decreased dramatically. The truth is, I think most minority businesses have basically given up on going to the major banks to get any sort of financing. They feel it's a waste of time. What you want is a much larger number of smaller institutions that will keep the, the influence of the sector under control. Bernie Sanders spoke to this very clearly about the need to break up the banks and to place them under a much stricter form of regulation. While neither Clinton nor Trump talk about breaking up the banks, Sanders' influence resulted in it becoming part of both parties' platforms. The Democratic Party now calls for breaking up the major financial institutions on Wall Street. So far, Trump's only mention of antitrust has been in regard to media companies he has jousted with. AT&T is buying Time Warner and thus CNN a deal we will not approve in my administration because it's too much concentration of power in the hands of too few. The proposed merger would be an early test for a Clinton administration as well. The 2016 Democratic platform mentions antitrust issues for the first time since 1988. Do other cities in America face similar problems to St. Louis from industry consolidation? Absolutely. Consolidation has definitely wrecked America's job machine. And the consolidation is taking place on an increasingly global scale. Few mergers are more emblematic of this than the Belgian company InBev's 2008 takeover of the St. Louis brewer Anheuser-Busch. Thousands are gone. It was tragic. Those were my friends and family. As a human resources professional at Anheuser-Busch, Ronnie Chambers laid off hundreds for InBev. Then she was let go. Today, she's a career coach. Some other folks had a tough time. I had a tough time. Um, but, but I believe with all my heart 
that for everybody that lost their job, it's their responsibility to pull up their bootstraps and figure out how to go on. How did the culture change when InBev took over Anheuser-Busch? Um, in one word, ruthless. It's about cost reduction and it's about returning profits to the shareholders. I'm a fan of getting out of that corporate space and building the future. Chambers has her office at Cortex, a business incubator for high-tech startups. In this building or in buildings like this all over the country, new companies are being born. Aren't you concerned that technological advance could eliminate a lot of jobs and make it hard for people to find employment? I disagree with that. I mean, I have grandchildren today that I don't believe their jobs exist yet. But it's not clear the digital revolution will generate as many jobs as it eliminates, something neither presidential candidate has addressed. The coming changes were on display at the International Manufacturing Technology Show back in Chicago. This is Ollie, and uh, this particular model is a people mover. Alex Victor is the head of product development for Local Motors, an Arizona company. Uh, as you can see, no driver controls built into the design of the interior. This particular one is for moving people like on campuses or going around on private properties like resorts. But ultimately, there's a lot that you could do with an autonomous platform. Local Motors is a leader in manufacturing vehicles using 3D printing technology. This car was printed in only 44 hours. On the people side of things, you know, you're limiting the immediate human involvement uh, required other than operating those machines and designing for those machines. The digital revolution is an aggressive destroyer of jobs. Do you think the impact of technological advances on jobs is going to create a need for a guaranteed basic income? Rather than a, a basic income grant, I would be more attracted to the idea of a job guarantee. But a federal job guarantee is currently taboo in American politics. The closest either candidate gets to government support for jobs is infrastructure investment. We will rebuild our roads, our bridges, our tunnels, our highways, our airports, schools, hospitals. We'll rebuild everything. But Trump hasn't offered any serious proposal about how he would pay for it. If we invest in infrastructure now, we'll not only create jobs today, but lay the foundation for the jobs of the future. To fund her $500 billion plan, Clinton says she will tax the wealthy and set up a bank to tap private investors. Her proposal emphasizes clean energy projects, like installing half a billion solar panels in her first term. Those industries probably would not provide more than a fraction of the new jobs that the population of the United States actually needs. The overwhelming majority of workers are in what we call the services sector. So we need people working in education, working in childcare, in healthcare, in care for the elderly. We need, in other words, to have institutions to which people can go and find useful work. It would certainly help if we had a full employment national policy. Um, but part of that policy would be getting trade right. Where do you think American capitalism is heading? I think increasingly corporate management is going to um, come under fire and the wave of giant mergers is likely to trigger a much more active antitrust policy. So, you know, the U.S. has its problems, but if you ask me whose cards I'd want to play, I'd rather play the U.S. cards than anybody else's. The past rates of growth are not achievable and a high rate of growth tends to mitigate and resolve social problems. When you have a slower rate of growth, you have more people who are actually worse off. So you need to protect those people. So you think Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton are both trying to offer a message of a high growth economy, is that right? I That's mean correct, yeah. You have, in Donald Trump's case, it's of course, I can bring back the 1950s. In Hillary Clinton's case, there is a, a body of policy papers there. But unfortunately, what I have heard her say is that she would bring back the 1990s when her husband was in charge. And the 1990s were a credit-fueled, technology-driven business boom, which cannot be repeated. So I think we're looking at two camps, both of which are in the grip of illusions about the conditions that we actually face. 